Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's Free CompTIA A Plus Certification Training Course. I'm James Messer. In this module, we're going to talk a lot about memory. We're going to give you an overview of memory and how memory is used in our personal computer systems. This comes from the CompTIA exam objectives for the very first exam, the Essentials Exam 220-601. And in Section 1.1, we are asked to identify the names, purposes, and characteristics of memory. And so this types of memory and operational characteristics is perfect to what we're going to be talking about today. We'll give you an overview, certainly, of what memory is, but we're also going to go into a number of operational concepts about memory, things you may have heard about but weren't quite certain exactly what those were. And we'll end up our conversation today with a short discussion of something called read-only memory, or ROM. So the question begins then, what is memory? Memory, in the way that we describe it usually, is random access memory. And that's the most common one, especially when we describe memory to someone. But it's not the only kind of memory. I was just mentioning today we're going to talk about read-only memory as well. There's other types of memory out there. We'll talk about a few of those today as well. Now, one thing I often hear people describe memory is they they misinterpret the memory value inside their computer, the amount of memory they have with the size of the hard drive space that they have. They'll say that I have 120 gig of memory. But they don't. They have 120 gig of hard drive space. Very few people in the world have 120 gig of memory in their system. And so that's an important concept to keep in mind is memory is not hard drive space. Don't mix these two things up. What really happens when you're working with memory is that the data is stored on the hard drive, but it has to be put into this random access memory for it to be able to execute. Nothing ever executes on the hard drive. The hard drive is simply a store place, a permanent storage place. You have to pull it off of the hard drive, put it into this random access memory to be able to do anything with it. So to be able to view this movie, to be able to surf the web, to be able to play solitaire, you have to have that in the random access memory on your system. Let's take a few minutes and talk about how memory works. You may look at this memory architecture. This should look familiar if you've gone through some of our other course materials that talked about the architecture of a computer and of CPUs. So I took a little section of that particular diagram, just the part that has the CPU in it, also the part that has what we call the North Bridge, or what we'll often call today the Memory Controller Hub. And we also have this representation of memory banks. Now, memory itself is, is not seen directly by the CPU. You can see the CPU is not directly tied to those memory chips that we happen to have in our computer. The CPU has in front of it this memory controller hub. And just like the name implies, the memory controller hub essentially is in charge of handling everything to do with memory. That means that the CPU doesn't have direct access to the memory. And that's a good thing, because then the CPU doesn't have to keep, keep control of the memory. It simply asks the memory controller hub for a certain address in this spreadsheet of memory. And the memory controller hub, its job is to go out and obtain that memory from these memory banks. And that makes the process very efficient. The CPU can concentrate on performing the calculations that it needs to do. And we can create these memory controller hubs whose sole purpose in life is to make sure that they can retrieve information from memory and provide that information to the CPU. Although it looks pretty complex here with a front side bus and a memory bus here and all these other little pieces in between, it actually is a very, very efficient process. When we begin using memory, let's go through the entire steps of exactly where data is stored in a system, especially memory and how it is stored in a system. If you were to open up a CPU and look inside, you would see these little storage areas called registers. Those registers are used as temporary storage by the CPU so that it can perform calculations and many other processes within the CPU itself. These are very, very small areas of working space inside the CPU. They're not very big at all. They're there to be used for a calculation, and then they're used for something else. There's not a lot of CPU registers, but they're an extremely important part of having processes done inside of the CPU. 
just outside of the CPU, and really in most cases embedded as part of the CPU, are these things called caches. There are on-die caches. These are caches that are on the CPU die itself. They're actually part of the circuitry of the CPU. They're stored in there. The type of RAM that is in a cache is called static RAM or SRAM. Now you're starting to see we're getting into a number of abbreviations. There are a lot of abbreviations and a lot of information when it it deals with memory. So you're going to see a lot of these as we go through these memory videos. This static RAM inside a cache in a CPU is very fast. It's extremely fast memory. It's really expensive memory, too. That's why there's not a lot of it. That's why we just don't have this extremely fast memory in our whole system, because we just can't afford it if you were to have as much as you would need to run a computer system. We often refer to these caches, if you've seen our earlier videos, as a, a level one, a, a layer one, and a layer two cache. But oftentimes, you'll see also an external off die cache. It's a cache that's external to the CPU. Now, often we'll call that an L3 cache. But these L1 and L2 and L3 aren't necessarily used in this way with every configuration of every motherboard and every CPU. These are just general ways that we happen to see it being used in the industry today. A term that you'll often hear once this comes off of the cache and it goes into the memory controller, and the memory controller saves it off to those memory sticks, those memory sticks we will refer to as dynamic random access memory. We'll talk about what that exactly means in a moment. But when you buy memory from the store, what you're buying is this DRAM, this dynamic RAM. And that is the thing that we most often think about when we want to upgrade memory, when we want to change the memory in our system. It's this dynamic random access memory we're referring to. When your systems are using these programs, what you'll find is, is often you'll run out of memory or there will be an opportunity to take information that you aren't currently using and save it off to your hard drive. It's something your CPU and your, your operating system is doing all the time. You may see your hard drive just start flashing, even though you're not really doing anything very active on your system. That's probably because it's saving some information out to the hard drive, or it's retrieving information from the hard drive. And it's what, what that's called is virtual memory. It's not real memory sticks, me memory chips that are in your system. We're actually using a portion of your hard drive as memory, which extends the capabilities of your system and allows many things to run at one time inside of the real memory that you happen to have. The way that this information goes in and out of that hard drive is something called a paging system. So you'll hear the words paging file. You'll hear virtual memory. And that's what it's referring to is that extra space on your hard drive that's used for memory. So from the very beginning to the very end, all the way from inside the CPU, there's a place all the way through this process where we want to keep an eye of what's happening with memory. In this next section of the video, I wanted to step through some operational concepts about memory and some things that are really important to keep in mind when you're talking about memory inside of a personal computer system. One thing you want to think about is something called the transfer of memory and the bandwidth that is used by memory. As you recall to that architectural diagram I showed earlier, there's a memory bus, there's a front side bus, there's a bus and a pathway between the memory and the CPU. The bandwidth that's used to move that information back and forth or the width of this memory bus is something you have to keep in mind. You have to have the right kind of memory that's going to fill the bus. In fact, some of the memory that you can get, you can duplicate the type of memory in your system and essentially double the amount of information that's transferred with every clock cycle. We call that the bandwidth. So the more information we can transfer with every tick of the clock, the more efficient our system is going to be. We want to make sure that the memory that we have in our system can maximize this bandwidth. And you'll see often that the memory bandwidth is described in number of bits. It's also described in number of bytes. In most modern systems, you'll find that most systems have a memory bandwidth of about 64 bits or 8 bytes. Sometimes it's doubled so that you can move twice as much of that at one time. The number of physical chips that are actually on a memory module, if you were to pull it out and look at the number of chips, really doesn't matter. The, the number of chips, actually, there may be 8 chips. There may be 
uh, 16 chips or maybe nine chips. There may be four chips. The number of chips doesn't matter. What's internal to the memory module itself is the important part. And that's what often makes it very difficult when you begin doing upgrades of memory. You may be pulling out one type of memory and putting in a type that looks very different than the original. But don't be thrown by that. Internal to the memory module, it's keeping track of everything. The physical number of chips on the module doesn't matter at all. Speed of memory is also very important. For this synchronous dy dynamic random access memory that we use, the synchronous DRAM is synchronized to that bus. That front side bus and that memory bus is all running at the same speed. And so the memory that we put in a system will be synchronized to that front side bus. You'll notice that we'll often have this memory speed identified as throughput in megabytes per second or perceived throughput. And as we go through the different memory types, I'll show you how those different memory types use this naming convention as you move from one piece of memory to another. The, for instance, if we look at SD RAM measured in clock speed, let's say that we have a 100 megahertz front side bus. The type of memory we're going to put in there is something called PC100. Now, we don't really use that type of memory any longer in modern systems. But if you run into an older system, you may see that it's running PC100 or PC133. If you run into some Pentium 3 or Pentium 4 systems, you may see something like that there. In newer memory, like DDR and DDR2, and we'll describe what those particular DDR and DDR2, we'll describe what those are referred to in, a, in the next video. But we measure throughput differently if you're using that kind of memory. In fact, that throughput is measured in megabytes per second. So if you have that same 100 megahertz bus and it's moving 8 bytes in every clock cycle, then you're moving 800 megabytes per second with every tick of the clock. In DDR, you have that described as PC1600. It's describing exactly how much it can move with every tick. DDR2 essentially doubles that. And you can see the name there, PC2-3200. So as you go out to buy memory or specify memory for system, you'll notice these numbers are very large. They're not really tied directly back to the, the speed of the bus itself. You have to then do the calculations to see if the type of memory that's specified actually matches the speed of the bus that we'd like to use. Fortunately, most organizations that sell memory will say specifically that it's for a certain speed bus. And here is the DDR or DDR2 model type. So you'll have both of those available to you. But it's nice to know where that name came from. You'll also see memory described in latency terms. You'll see something called a CAS. And that stands for, well, it's written up as two different things depending on where you look. Column address strobe, which it's often referred to, and perhaps not as often referred to as column address select. Uh, what's important about this is they're exactly the same thing. It's the same uh, technology, CAS latency, or CL, is what you're really going to find when you start specifying memory. This is the number of clock cycles that it takes once the memory is requested to finally get an answer from the memory. Just because we ask for something in memory, there's time that it takes for the memory to go to the location, grab the information, and pull it back to the memory controller. So that means that the lower the CL number, the faster that memory is going to be. So when we start specifying the type of memory we want, very often want to look for a very low CL number or get that as low as you can. In today's memory with the high bus speeds and the type of memory we're using, you very often are going to get CL values of 4 or 5 or 6. Don't be thrown by that. Just know that when you're selecting the memory, you're finding some that has the lowest one available for the bus speed that you're looking for. Here is a good example of this. If you're looking at a DDR667 megahertz bus, and you're looking at memory that is CL equals 4, that's going to be faster than DDR2 memory running on a 667 megahertz bus where the CL is equal to 5. Notice that I spelled out exactly the same megahertz front side bus for this. If the front side bus is a different speed, then the latency on this 
won't matter quite as much. There'll be a big difference between those two, and you have to do some calculations to see which is faster or slower. And there's a lot of online resources that can help you for, with that, but that is a bit outside the scope of the a certification. So we're not really going to go into it in these videos, but it's an interesting thing to go through. What if your DDR2 front side bus was a 800 megahertz bus running at CL4 and 667 megahertz running at CL5 or vice versa? You have to figure out which one's faster. So always looking at the lowest latency number isn't necessarily the thing you should be looking for. Make sure that your bus values are the same if you're going to compare apples to apples. There's also a type of memory that checks itself. If you're running a very critical computer system like a server or a, a, some type of database device or you're in a, a situation where you have a lot of different servers, perhaps in a server farm, the, you need memory that's going to be very, very secure. It's going to make sure that it's calculating everything properly. And the very first type of this memory that checked itself is something called parity memory. This parity memory is not something you see much anymore, but the way that it worked is it added an extra bit into the memory and essentially, essentially an extra chip onto the memory card. And that memory module detected when an error occurred by performing a calculation of every byte that went through it. And if the bit was recalculated a little bit differently and the bits didn't match up, it knew there was an error. The problem with parity memory, however, is that it didn't always it, it had no way to correct an error. So essentially it would tell you that an error occurred. It would essentially shut down your system to make sure that nothing was damaged, but there was no way for it to fix that problem. That's why we came out with a new technology called error correcting code memory or ECC memory. This not only detects when an error is occurring, it corrects the error on the fly. And you'll often see this. If you happen to have a, a, just a glitch with the motherboard, maybe there was a power spike, maybe the cosmic rays were acting a little odd that day, and you happen to have an error in that data stream, the ECC memory would correct it. Now, not every system uses this ECC memory. It's a little more expensive. And it's got to be designed specifically for the motherboard that you're using. So if the motherboard says you can use ECC, then you can. The motherboard will probably probably specifically tell you also that it will not use ECC memory. The problem is that the memory modules themselves look exactly the same. So there's not, not much difference between the two. Very similar in the way they look. So make sure that you're using the type of memory, the error corrective memory, on the motherboard that's specific to that motherboard type. You'll also hear a term called registered memory. This is often referred to as buffered memory when you start buying and acquiring different memory and going out and doing specifications. And I have a picture of this registered memory on the screen here. In fact, the top part of it looks like any regular memory module. But you'll notice there's a few extra pieces of information down here near the bottom of that. And that's buffered systems. That allows this particular memory module to buffer up the contents of memory before it sends it out to the motherboard and vice versa. This is used very often on larger systems that might have four or six or even eight different memory slots in it. When you have that much memory in a system with that much power and you're wanting to have this system run as quickly as possible, you're going to need some buffering so that these systems don't overwrite each other so there's no problem in the transfer of information. And so this additional memory is there to actually buffer that link between the RAM itself and the memory controller. Nice to have that registered memory in there in those larger systems. Again, you won't see this on a smaller desktop system or a laptop. This is really designed for those larger systems with very, very advanced motherboards used in server environments. Now there's one type of situation you may run into with something in a memory package called a single side or double side memory. And if you go out onto the web and you start doing some research in your A plus books, you're going to find that different books will tell you different things about single sided and double sided. And as I was putting together this video series, it became quite a mystery to figure out exactly what was meant by single sided and double sided. And if you think about it, from the uh, uh, just a normal perspective, you would think that a memory module that had all the memory chips on one side would be a single-sided memory module. And if it had chips on both sides, it was a double-sided memory module. But no, it's not quite that simple. It really has nothing to do with the physical layout of the memory package. And the whole uh, online forums and different books have really confused the issue. 
what this is really talking about is something called ranks. And ranks is a relatively new term that's used. Often it's it's used in other ways, but we're going to use the term that's used most modernly called ranks. And this is a group of memory on a grouping of memory on a memory module. A single memory module may have multiple ranks on there. And the way that the memory controller accesses it is one rank at a time. It may go to the first rank and gather information. To get anything from the other rank, it has to switch over to that rank to gather memory and access the information that's within that rank. Those ranks are what we refer to as sides. And I got this information from Intel, who says that 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 group of memory that's looking between this memory and accessing it at any one time uh, is called this this ranking or this single sided and double sided. You may often see it referred to as rows. So if you look at some older documentation, that's maybe what it's talking about. And the memory controller is responsible for moving back and forth. In the Intel 875P chipset memory configuration guide, in fact, there were other chipset memory configurations that I found. But I figure the best way to find out exactly what this means is to ask the people that make the memory controller itself. They'll certainly know what single-sided and double-sided is. And this is the link for the location for the PDF that talked about uh, the rankings. And if there is one rank on a memory module, it's a single-sided DIMM. If it's two ranks on a memory module, it's a double-sided DIMM. So as you go through your A plus studies and we talk about single-sided and double-sided, that's exactly what we're talking about. If you go to the motherboard documentation for your motherboard, it will tell you if you need single-sided or double-sided memory. And that's what it's referring to. And your memory specifications will tell you as you're shopping for memory that this memory is single-sided or this memory is double-sided. This is a screenshot of that PDF from that. 875p memory controller hub. And you can see right here at the bottom, it's talking about the number of ranks per memory module and exactly what you would expect to see, where one rank is a single-sided DIMM and two ranks is a double-sided DIMM. Hopefully, that's closed the book on determining what a single-sided versus a double-sided memory module might be. Let's also talk about read-only memory. Up to this point, we've been talking about memory that can be randomly accessed. Anytime you'd like, you can overwrite it and do anything you'd like to it. But read-only memory works a little bit differently. Read-only memory cannot be changed. It can't be erased. So if you're going to think about putting a basic input-output system on a computer, something that as you turn the power on, the computer's got to go somewhere to know what to do. And read-only memory can't be erased, even if you turn the computer off. So that's a perfect place to go. In fact, this is the chip that's from a motherboard that I have that contains the BIOS inside of my system. There's other types of read-only memory. One that was uh, created was called programmable read-only memory. This was used for somebody who was in the field who wanted to write some specific code to a ROM. And once it was written, that was it. You couldn't go back and overwrite it again. And so they'd burn it in the field, and they'd plug it into one of these modules, and off it would go. And if you wanted to fix it, replace it, or put different code on it, you'd have to physically remove this chip and add a new chip into that. Well, we want, want to do something better than that. So we came out with something called EEPROM, Erasable Programmable Read-Only Memory, where you could write it. You could erase it and then write it again. That was very successful, but you needed specific hardware to be able to do that, some ultraviolet light that would be able to erase it and perform that process again. And in personal computers, we don't really have that kind of equipment sitting around in our offices and our homes. So this new type of electrically erasable programmable read-only memory, that's a mouthful, that is what we often refer to as flash memory. We can simply uh, load some software into our computer and tell our computer computer, erase the, the ROM that's in our system, and overwrite it with something else. You don't need any third-party hardware. Very simple to do, and people do it all the time every day. In review, we've talked about what memory is and exactly how it works. We've also gone through a number of operational concepts about bandwidth and speed and latency that are going to be very important for you when you go into the A-plus exam and very important as we go through these other memory-related videos. And we ended our conversation today with read-only memory or ROM. And of course, for our message boards, for our study guides, for our wiki, or if you'd like, just like to make a comment on the video that you've seen here today, feel free to visit our website at freeaplus.com.